Hello everybody and welcome to The War Room. This one is the aftermath for UFC 257. Slightly different show this time around. Obviously I know some of you have missed aftermath so I've rejigged it a little bit. Um, I wanted to bring an interactive element to it. So it's now called Question and Aftermath or Q&A and we're, we're going to start off with some Twitter questions which is why you can see this is loaded up in the screen. I will get into some, some fight stuff in a little while but I just wanted to kind of rattle through and answer some of these questions from the fans um, and what I will be doing at some point in the near future is doing these live so we can have a chat back and forth and I can just, I can answer the questions as they come. Um, but I've selected a few here. If I rattle through a couple of them, it's because I've either answered the question or I'm going to answer it later. Um, so, okay, well, let's get started. So first of all, uh, thanks goose1636. Um, would you say mind games are a big, uh, um, are big and effective part of McGregor's game plan. Uh, the lead up to this fight had very little. Yeah, I, I agree, but I also think we saw a different version of McGregor anyway. I think he was he was far more calm and respectful. I think he's, I think not only is he trying to represent himself better, but also you know the companies that he's growing at the moment. I think he's got that in mind, and and I just you know, I, I think he's trying to, <laughs> I think he's trying to put his best foot forward. I, I, I also don't think Poirier was really in a position where psychologically he was he was as vulnerable to McGregor this time around so you know wh whether whether it would have worked if he'd invested any any time in that or not I don't I don't think it would have helped and and the fact that he didn't do any trash talking against Cowboy I actually felt was was a big part of his game plan there was a thought process to that um because Cowboy kind of pulls himself apart as it is McGregor may have looked at Poirier and thought to, thought to himself well if I'm real nice to him in the lead up that might kind of keep him off guard for the first 60 seconds so I can jump on him. And, and with the way that McGregor started, the speed that he attacked him at, I mean, he was he was halfway across the octagon before the, the fight started. Um, I, I do kind of feel like McGregor had banked everything on stopping him in the first minute. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think he expected the niceness and the calm, the calm way he was going about it in the build-up to be able to, uh, you know, maybe freeze Poirier with pressure. But you know he maintained it after his loss, like he did against Nate Diaz first time around. You know he always he always handles loss very well. Um, so maybe maybe not. Maybe he's just going to focus on uh, on on his MMA game, or maybe he's just going to apply the psychological stuff when he feels like the opponent would be vulnerable to it. So we'll see how he goes next. Uh, I think there are certainly a couple of people in this division. Like imagine if you fought Tony Ferguson. I've, I've got Ollie here, so I might keep looking off camera. Imagine if you fought Tony Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be hilarious. I mean, the build-up, and obviously the Nate Diaz fight. You, there's going to be trash talk in that because that's what sells those fights. So anyway, and for the people that complain about me drinking on the podcast, I'm not sure exactly what you're, what they're expecting. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, John Snow, um, what type of improvement uh, kind of need to make against leg kick? Uh, now it going to be a blueprint. Obviously, I'm going to read this a bit clearer. Uh, what type of improvement does Connor need to make against the leg kick? And now is this a blueprint to beat him? Um, well, I, th I mean, I think one of the bl blueprints to beat Connor was always to, to to take him into the deeper waters. And I think that might be something that's still going to be in the back of whoever's facing him in the future's mind. I also think the low kick has been been there all the way along, all the way through his career, just because of the amount of weight he puts on that lead leg. But I will also say... Um, the kick is more vulnerable against another southpaw because they've got their rear leg to dig into your lead leg, and it's 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 not quite as easy to land that um, if you're if you're fighting someone of opposite stances. So I think he's less less vulnerable to the leg kicks against other orthodox fighters, but certainly something they're going to try and work into their game now. But you know you know what McGregor's like; he's going to adapt from that, and he's going to find a way of countering it, uh, you know, pressuring through it or using his footwork to control it. I know there's there's a question on low kicks in a little while, which I want to get to just to kind of give you a, um, like an overall what I think could be done with them. But we'll get into that. But certainly it's going to be something that is exposed on McGregor going forward if, you know, anybody that's facing him, you know, work his lead leg, taking him into deeper waters. You, you're always going to improve your chances there. I think he's going to be the mindset. Certainly something for McGregor to fix. Okay, Ash, if you book Poirier's next fight, um, would you want to make the Chandler fight or the trilogy with McGregor? For me, Poirier has got nothing really to gain from fighting McGregor again, aside from a, a, a shit ton of cash. 
I, I really think Poirier's next move is he's in, in, interested in the belt. He's interested in getting to that title and uh, you know, and getting the real one wrapped around his waist, whether that, that's against Khabib or anybody. So for me, Poirier's just got to keep progressing to the title. And there are only a couple of guys really in his way. I mean, there's no real need in him facing Gaethje again. I don't think there's anything to be proved there. If he beats Charles Oliveira, then that that immediately takes out any reason to fight a whole bunch of people, including Tony Ferguson. Um, and then Michael Chandler looked very impressive. I think, you know, one of those two wins really for me is, you know, puts Poirier in striking distance of the, of the title or, or if not with the belt around his waist by beating either of those two guys. For me, Chandler and uh, Oliveira are the two to beat. I don't think Poirier's got that much to gain from fighting anybody else at this point, unless Nate comes back. And, you know, Nate would be an interesting fight as well. Um, but, f- you know, f- for me, f- if if I'm Poirier, if I'm Poirier's manager, uh, if I'm booking his next fight and it's against Chandler or Oliveira, I would want the belt on the line for either of those fights, especially if, if Khabib's not coming back. Because the thing that will entice Khabib back will be either Chandler or Oliveira. It's going to be somebody new. It won't be someone he's beaten before. Um, okay, what's the next one? Quick drink. What holes did you see in Dustin's game? Thank you, most sloppy fish. <laughs> I'd love to know the name, the stories behind some of these screen names and, and how you how you get to those kind of names. Um, anyway, <clears throat> holes in Dustin's game. You know, the, the, the same the same holes in Dustin's game have been there since the early WEC days. Like he's aggressive. And he wades into range and sometimes he is vulnerable to shots. I mean, you know, McGregor caught him with a couple of good shots. The, the You know, the the lead uppercut that he landed, you know, what, a couple of three minutes into the first round is the same punch that he landed against uh, Max Holloway. When Holloway started to expect the, the, the left, he pumped the left and then threw the momentum of the punch into his lead right uppercut. And, it, you know, it's a lovely punch. There were certainly shots that got through for Poirier. I just don't think McGregor dressed it up enough. Uh, and I think that's why it was easier for Poirier to deal with. But I also think it was a great performance from him. You know, he did the right things at the right time. He smothered him with a takedown in, in the early going of the fight when McGregor's at his best, that he's strongest, force him to work, fill his arms with lactic acid and make him heavier. And then as soon as he was back on the feet, you know, let McGregor throw his punches and make sure his defense is tight and just dig that calf kick a few times. It was, a, it was a smart game plan from Dustin, using the tools that he's had all the way through his career. He just applied them very well. Um, I, I still think that there are holes in Dustin's game that would make him vulnerable to someone like a Michael Chandler, who will power double you know, through his takedown defense potentially, or someone like Charles Oliveira, who might be able to keep him at distance with good, you know, a good jab and good kicks and then strangle him on the floor. Like, you know, Dustin's definitely not a, not a perfect fighter, but he did put together an, you know, a near-perfect game plan against McGregor. And when you've got the skills and knowledge and experience that Poirier's got, it becomes less about being a perfect MMA fighter and more about putting the perfect game plan together for your opponent. Um, and that, I think that's where we saw Dustin turn a corner at the weekend. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, holes in his game, but no, nothing that's uh, nothing that's not going to exclude him from the top five in the world. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> not thoughts, Jake Jugger. Not. Um, do you agree that the, the next matchups to make are Poirier v Chandler since uh, both beat Dan Hooker and McGregor v Gaethje since both were uh, KO'd by Poirier? The McGregor Gaethje fight makes a lot of sense. As I said about Poirier and Chandler, I, I think maybe Chandler could do with an extra fight before he uh, before he you know he gets put in there for a belt. Let's assume the belt's vacant. For me, Poirier needs to be insistent on the next next fight being for the title. Doesn't matter who it's against because I think he's the most deserving. Um, and I don't think he needs to beat Gaethje again in order to to prove that. Um, but certainly, you know, if he beats Chandler or Oliveira, I would expect one of those to be for the belt. But McGregor v Gaethje makes a lot of sense, especially because I feel like that's a good fight for McGregor to really look his best because notoriously Gaethje's there to be hit, but also he's not someone that wants to wrestle uh, heavy against an opponent. So, we, you know, we might not see McGregor having to defend a lot of takedowns in that one. I mean, Gaethje's predominantly a takedown defense and, and knockout artist so that could be absolute fireworks and both guys are in a situation where they need a win back in the column to uh, to warrant that so it, you know the UFC always like to pair people coming off a loss against somebody else coming off a loss but I will say McGregor against uh, Tony Ferguson would be would be delightful <laughs> okay Callum Lucas if the trilogy were to happen 
um, and you coach McGirt, Connor, uh, what would you change in the game plan? I would take him back to his old school style of, uh, of, of cutting the octagon down. You know, I think he was just too aggressive against Poirier. He came out and he pushed him back with aggression, with footwork, didn't use his long range kicking game. You know, the McGregor that came out against Brandau was heavier on his rear leg. He had a longer guard and he was much more um, agile in his kicking game to, to, to basically corral them up against the fence where he can start uh, unloading his fists. He was straight into punching range against Poirier to the point where I think he was trying to make Poirier uncomfortable, but it also left McGregor vulnerable to some things that he didn't you know, really want to be, being the takedown and the low kicks. Um, I, I, would, I think Connor could have quite easily cruised through that first round and made it look very, very strong and dominant. Um, just by using his kicking game and his and his his presence, you know, I still think he could have pushed Poirier back. I think he put himself at harm's reach to try and get the fight finished early, and it backfired. Um, and that there's anything wrong with that game plan necessarily. I think five times out of five, it probably works for McGregor. Um, but just to, just to, to increase the odds, I would want to put that doubt in Poirier's mind first. And because Poirier was most likely expecting McGregor to jump on him. I think that uh, Connor coming out with a long-range kicking game, showing some of that taekwondo that he was working earlier in his MMA career, and also probably you know being more offensive with his grappling. I think that's something that's massively under underutilized and underestimated of Connor's. Um, so you know there are other facets to his game, I, I, and he, he, much like John Jones, he has striking at every range. He goes from long-range kicking to to you know short-range punching and teeps to the midsection and then he's very very good in the clinch with his with his knees and his shoulders and elbows like there are a few people that can fight at every range of striking Connor just cut through two ranges to get into a range that he felt was going to be more dominant and I just think he may be he may be progressed too quickly I hope that answers that question okay Mohawk Jimmy Mohawk Jimmy what a name <clears throat> do you think Connor? Sh uh, do you think Connor should now do the trilogy fight with Nate? And what weight class, in my opinion, I'd like to see them fight at lightweight? Hashtag question and aftermath. Hashtag UFC picks pod. I agree. I think the Nate Diaz fight is going to happen because there's money written all over it, and either of those fight, either of those guys can sell a fight, no matter whether they're coming off a win or a loss. Just they're charismatic and they're exciting to watch. So the, the trilogy is always the golden ticket. If they're serious about competing at lightweight, then I think it's beneficial in both of them pushing for the fight in that division. Because a win for Connor over another re recognized lightweight that isn't even in the rankings is still going to do a lot for his argument for a title shot just because he's that valuable of a fighter. So it makes sense for them to do lightweight. And then, you know, imagine if Nate beats him in the third fight, you've got another really interesting guy in the top sort of five or six that you can put in there with... Gaethje or Poirier or Chandler or Oliveira or Tony Ferguson. <laughs> I mean, you know, you want Nate in those fights. So there's no risk in putting him in there against Connor and lightweight makes sense because then he's already in that pool of fighters and can uh, can always be can always be thrown into an interesting fight. Um, okay. Oh. Jack. Jack Ginge Miller. How does one check calf kicks or defensive strategies to calf kicks? So I wanted to drop this in. I know it's not specific to UFC 257, but this this technique has been so valuable in so many fights recently that uh, um, I've even seen. I even saw a discussion on Twitter the other day of somebody wanting to remove calf kicks, <laughs> which made me giggle because it's effective. <laughs> um, so the thing is with calf kicks, first of all, the, the, oppo the opponent that's throwing the calf kick has to get pretty close to you. If they're leaning away as they're throwing the calf kick, yes, it can sting and yes, it can make enough contact to do a bit of damage, but it's the commitment with the shin bone that is what's te what tends to be guaranteeing the damage. Um, I think there are a couple of a couple of options. And, and one of the reasons why McGregor's not paid for the calf kicks in previous fights is because he's been fighting a lot of orthodox fighters who have not got as easy access to that lead leg without getting punched down the pipe with a left hand. So I think that's one of the reasons why McGregor's not faced it in, in the past. The, the other thing as well is it's, it's very difficult to appreciate how painful that is unless you've been through that process that McGregor's experienced in his last fight. Like that was That's agony. You know, there, there are certain times when his leg gave out as he was pr pressuring forward. Like 
that's going to stick in his mind. It will change the way he approaches the, the game. Fundamentally, it will change the way he approaches the fight because now he knows that's a vulnerability that he doesn't want to face in the future. I, I think as far as as far as solving the problem of calf kicks, the more I the more I mull it over, the more the more it makes sense that you just have to attack the kick. And and this is like if you look at tie boxers, there's a reason why in tie boxing they stand heavy on their rear leg is because that lead leg. If you put too much weight on that, it becomes very vulnerable to low kicks. You can also use that lead leg to prod and poke at people um, when they're kicking you to off balance them, you know, hip check them and, and make them uncomfortable. Um, it's another va- very valuable technique. The reason that people don't do that in MMA is because if you're already on your lead leg, you, you, to drive somebody's balance point over their back heel is almost already done for you. So you need a rear leg that's pushed that's that's pushed back a bit to brace that oncoming force. So it, it doesn't work as well in MMA. You have to put some weight onto your lead leg, but at the same time, recognizing when someone's going to throw a calf kick and being prepared to check it with bones is is I think the only solution because it's going to hurt the other person as much as it hurts you if you check it with 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 shin and they might not want to throw it again. And it's certainly going to hurt, but it's going to hurt less than a calf kick that leads to a TKO. So like you, you've kind of got to choose your poison. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to hurt. I, I, have, I have a friend and I'm going to test this. He's a bit of a maniac anyway. His name's Scott Briggs. Love him to death. He's a drummer, like a hardcore punk drummer. He, he has that muscle. Ollie, what's the muscle called? Tibialis anterior. Tibialis anterior. That's why I keep him in the room. Tibialis anterior. Anterior? Anterior. Anterior. Front. Front side, of course, like an anterior deltoid. Tibialis anterior. So it's the muscle that runs down the front side, like the the outside of the shin bone. The, the shin bone's on the inside of the leg. So when you're checking kicks, you've got to lift up and turn that foot out, turn the leg out slightly. But the other thing that, you, that you'll notice when someone's got that muscle developed is as they flex their foot, it lifts that muscle slightly above the shin. And I definitely think that contracting that muscle is going to go some way towards protecting that uh, um, pr- protecting that um, that that vulnerable nerve, and and also the other thing as well, you know, when you're dealing with someone that's throwing spinning attacks, sometimes the worst thing to do is to move away from them. Of course, you want the person to miss and spin around three times and fall over, but oftentimes the best thing to do is to check the the attack, like catch it early, smother it. Almost like a goalkeeper running out of the net to smother a, a, a single attacker. Like you're closing the goal mouth down. You know, you're closing that range of motion of the kick down. You're meeting it. So I, I think there's a massive benefit in being aggressive with it. But then at the same time, you know, progressing sensibly with your footwork so you're not putting all your weight on it and leaving it vulnerable. Okay. Um, Scott Pete won. Chandler looked incredible, and despite a great performance from Dustin, uh, we know what happened last time he fought Khabib. Does Chandler pose the biggest threat and the most interest uh, matchup for Khabib uh, if he were to return? I certainly think that I certainly think that that's the kind of performance that Khabib was looking for. Um, I, I like I said before, I don't think I don't think Khabib's got any real interest in coming back to face Dustin or McGregor or Gaethje. Or I mean, even you know, even if Tony Ferguson was able to get him back to back, get himself back to a situation where he's you know he's, he's competitive for a title, I think that boat may have sailed. It's, it's going to be someone, someone interesting for Khabib that he feels is worthy for that thirtieth fight on his record. I think Michael Chandler is a good option, but I think he definitely has to beat somebody else. And and as as Khabib said going into the weekend, the one he's keeping his eye on is Charles Oliveira. Like they're the two guys, like. If we get the most important fight right now to make, as and not overlooking Dustin in any way, but the most important fight right now for Khabib's future is Chandler v. Oliveira. Because the winner of that fight, if one of those two guys wins impressively, that's Khabib coming back and clearing the division out again in one in one shot. Because he's beaten everybody else. You know? Oliveira beat Tony Ferguson. If Chandler beats Oliveira, then he's taken out both of those guys. Khabib comes back and beats Chandler. And that is just so, <laughs> it would be so incredibly impressive. And in one fight, he's basically shut the division down again without question. That's the fight for me to make. That's that's what I would want to see from it. But I, I, I you know, I think Chandler's got another fight in the, in his future um, before he, he gets in there with a title. And I'd certainly think Dustin's in a position to be fighting for the title next. So it may be Dustin v. Chandler or Oliveira, as I've said. 
Um, but yeah, certainly, it's going to be somebody new. I, I, I don't think. Uh, I don't think Khabib's coming back for a rematch. Not not against anybody. Okay, uh, Lee Robertson. Uh, given that Chandler won, do you think he needs another fight before he gets to a shot? In case blah blah blah. blah. Yes, absolutely. As I've discussed, I, I don't. I, I, I don't want to keep repeating myself because uh, you'll get sick of my voice. I do think he needs another fight. I mean, you could throw him in there against anybody. You you could you could give him. Um, Nate Diaz returning, you could give him uh, Poirier coming off that win, of course. Uh, Charles Oliveira, I keep going back to that. That's the, the the guy that wins that fight for me is is the top of it, top interest for Khabib. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. He can't. I mean, it, I was looking at the rankings and thinking, well, how? I mean, how much further down the rankings could you look if you? if you're Michael Chandler, because he's just beat Dan Hooker, who's ranked number six. So just slide him right in there at number six. Tony Ferguson, I think he'd just mow him down at this point. I don't think Connor's going to take a fight against someone that looked that good coming off the loss that he's just had. Charles Oliveira would be given up an opportunity where he's at right now at ranked third. I think he should be looking up and, you know, this is why I think Poirier v. Oliveira for a title makes sense. And then Gage is up there right at the top at the moment, but obviously that's going to shift soon. I mean, Gaethje would be a great fight. Can you imagine that? There's lots of opportunities, but I, I, I think Chandler's still one fight away from a title shot for sure. Okay, Wintery Bisping. Um, <laughs> wintery Bisping. Uh, how do you see Chandler v. Poirier going if it happens? I, I, I think... I think, again, for Poirier, it depends on that first round. It depends on what he can do with the pressure that he's under, with the power, with the brute force that Michael Chandler presents. I mean, obviously, Connor presents a different kind of force. That left hand, although it didn't look particularly spectacular at the weekend, it's still a very dangerous weapon. Uh, Poirier still has to get through those early rounds with Chandler. That's going to be like a Justin Gaethje style of fight. That's going to be an Eddie Alvarez kind of fight. It'll be a long, drawn-out battle where Poirier's defending takedowns and forcing Chandler to stand and trade in the pocket. You'll get Chandler who's starting to slow down because he throws big power in his punches and then Poirier will start to wear on him and wear on him. I mean, that's the most likely thing and I expect Poirier to be able to maybe beat him over the distance, uh, especially this version of Poirier. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the speed that Chandler and uh, the Chandler moves at and the, the power that he has in his hands... And I am going to break that fight down in a, in a moment. Th that was a great performance from him. It was a very, it was a very simple game plan. It was a very kind of paint by numbers, sell him the body shot, sell him the body shot, crack him when his hands are down with a with a left up to the head. There was nothing particularly fantastic about it. But you have to have, you have to be a fantastic fighter in order to get that reaction out of Dan Hooker in the first place. So it's not like like it was a very simple game plan. But you, but the pedigree of wrestling. And the speed of his movement coming into the UFC was what put Hooker in that situation. So a body of work and a great game plan. Um, I think that be I think that can beat anybody. Um, but you know, if someone's going to overcome, it's going to be someone like Poirier who has overcome Gaethje and Alvarez and can weather an early storm and uh, and deal with what comes what comes after. Um, and there's no doubt, you know the main event could have gone deep third, fourth, fifth round and Poirier would have been just as dangerous in those later rounds. I think his chances would have gotten better. If anything, it was more impressive that he got the stoppage in the second. Um, okay. Sutty's voice. <clears throat> Do you feel that Calderwood has earned a shot at Shevchenko? What would she have uh, to do to earn the respect in said fight to give her a chance? Okay. Um this is in no I'm not in any way trying to try and upset anybody here, but definitely Jojo needs another shot. She de she definitely needs another another fight, sorry. She's you know, she's just not in a position to be to be calling for a title shot at this stage. She just she's not had the wins that she needs consistently to to I mean, you've got to sell a title fight. Like you, you've got to, you've got to be able to make an argument for that individual. And and you know, when when Jennifer Meyer was going in there against Shevchenko, that you know, I mean, it was it was it's hard to make an argument for her against Shevchenko. It's hard to make an argument for most people against Shevchenko. 
like the difference with Jennifer Meyer is she like she was aggressive, she throws hands, and she's got a good good ground game as well. So like there are two facets that could get her the victory. With with JoJo, we we know that she's got one facet which is which is Muay Thai, classic Muay Thai, which is great. But at the same time, you have to be confident moving forward and cutting somebody down when they fight as long and as rangy as Shevchenko does. Like you can't. Like you can't be a long range tie boxer against that kind of fighter because you're going to get picked off walking in. Like so, you have to be confident closing distance and then maybe finding yourself in the clinch at some times and definitely defending takedowns. We saw good work in the clinch uh, against Jessica I at the weekend, and and I think that she's definitely showed improvement both physically and technically. But there's still there's still gaps in a game that we need to see. Um, we need to see closed. Uh, before she gets in there with with Shevchenko, and and not, I mean, she's always got the chance of catching her with a good shot, you know, good head kick or a knee on the way in or whatever. I'm not saying she doesn't have a have a chance, but y- you need to get to a stage where that that chance is obvious for everyone to see. And I just don't think she's there right now. Like she's, you know, I mean, she's alternating wins and losses. Um, she lost to Chukagi and lost to Jennifer Meyer. Both of those have had title shots, and they were both unsuccessful it would make sense for her to get a shot against someone like Chikagi. You know, I do, don't feel he's going to get a title shot anytime soon because of that loss to Andrade. But she has picked up a win recently. So she's kind of back in the win column. You know, she beat another good grappler in Cynthia Calvillo. That's another potential fight for Calderwood as well. So, you know, there's options for her for sure. Um, but she definitely needs at least one more fight. I wouldn't mind seeing her beat Calvillo, maybe uh, Chukagi, and then even have an eliminator against Lauren Murphy, who I think is going to be waiting behind uh, Andrade for a title shot. Um, but, you know, definitely on the rise. She's definitely improved, but just not quite enough yet for me to see her in, in there for for the belt. Okay, Housecat, who watches MMA? Um, this Housecat, it's quite amazing, has learned how to type during lockdown and sends me tweets regularly. And I do see the tweets. I just can't keep up with you, my friend. Um, I don't know how you type so quick with pause. Um, fairly simple question, but I feel like the answer may be deceptively complex. Oh, that's a good line to start with. What do you see as a potential for the next technique that is currently underutilized, but likely to become popular? Uh, the low calf kick is the latest example. What is likely next? Okay. I'm just going to quick check everything's recording. Still rolling. We're still rolling. Okay. I think I think there are lots of different techniques that are going to come come out and be fashionable for a while in the coming years and then fade away and you know some things will stick and some things will will understand how to utilize them better um you know obviously like ankle locks foot locks are, are coming back in MMA a little bit more now but that's that's down to the the progression of professional grappling and uh, you know you're being people being allowed to compete with leg locks um the, the, the fact that MMA is still a relatively new sport, like th- there haven't been many circumstances where people can figure out how to deal with calf kicks. So that's going to stick around for a while. And, and I, I would imagine it's going to be a very valuable target to, to know and to attack. There are multiple ways of, of attacking that same nerve. So, you know, there are variants, like say when someone's got a knee shield in half guard, you can attack that car, that, uh, that, that tibial nerve and, uh, and do damage to it when the person's not even on their feet so they can start feeling it when they stand. I also think attacking certain bones are going to be vulnerable uh, and I'm I'm putting ideas in people's minds here. But half guard top attacking collarbones is going to be a, a target I think at some point. Like we see we see people progressing things every now and then like obviously we you know McGregor with the the shoulder strikes uh John Jones against Teixeira and Gustafson like use like a wrenching motion to try and damage their shoulder. Like there's a lot more opportunities for that. And I, and I think that we're going to see those things. I know people are, are always a bit uncomfortable with the oblique kick or the chasse kick, as it's called in Savat. But it's a, it's a, it's a legal viable target. You know, you, you're attacking the muscle above the knee. It's, it's, a, it's a great technique to use. Um, I, I'm all for it. I also think, you know, knees to the head would be a, a really interesting one in uh, grappling situations as well. I'm not so fussed about soccer kicks because they generally get landed on people who uh, um, who have already been knocked down. But I, I think I think rules will certainly change things. The downward elbow um, rule hopefully will be changed soon. I think that'll open up new striking targets. 
Um, but people are still now understanding that rule, you know, striking from guard bottom or side control top, you can use those techniques or utilizing the, the old Travis Brown elbows up against the fence, another valuable technique which is finding its way into the sport. Um, but to answer your question, I think I think kicks to the lower parts of the legs in the clinch up against the fence is going to be valuable. I think foot, foot stomps will, will uh, find a value in the sport soon, a bit more than it is used at the moment. Um, and then you know I, I, I can see attack, I can see collarbones being attacked because I, I, I've dislocated my collarbone and I've, and I've damaged some other people's and it does completely debilitate their ability to do a lot of things. I've got Ollie shaking his head here from a from a right. There you go. It's uh, so I think I think there are lots of things that are going to come out come out of the woodwork. And the better the base, the foundation of MMA gets, the more we'll see some of these flare techniques coming out. You know, the old spinning attacks and the wacky and buckleys. Okay. Brutally honest MMA. We saw Chandler uh, make an amazing uh, introduction from Bellator to UFC. Off the back of that, uh, which two active fighters uh, would you pick for a cross-organization fight? That's a, a great question. I remember reading this the first time around and it's, it's been kicking around in my mind. Um, I mean, the, the, thing, the, the three that stick out in my mind immediately are the are fighters that have already been in the UFC. And I was sad when they left and I very much feel like they they deserve a, a roster spot back in the UFC. Uh, first one is Mads Burnell, um, who is is an incredible boxer, a great grappler, loads of neck attacks, Peruvian neckties, and all different kinds of stuff. He was in the UFC for a while. He lost to Arnold Allen and then got released, but that was a hell of a fight up until the point where he got caught in a choke. And, and I just think that, you know, being in the UFC and not really kind of fully understanding what he had in his hands he took it for granted a bit. He went away. He's made some improvements. And, and when I've seen him recently, he's looked deadly. Um, so Mads Benel certainly is one. I also would say Kyoji Horiguchi as well. I know he's off in Japan doing amazing things in Rising and he's an exciting fighter. But, the, you know, the way that the flyweight division is, I'd love to see him back in there. Even upper weight class, like, you know, Horiguchi against Cejudo or Horiguchi against um, uh, uh, Figueiredo. Great fights to make. Um, the other one, one of my all-time favorites, and I was so sad when he left the UFC, is Gegard Mousasi. You know, bring him back. He, he was just such, he's just such a slick fighter. Um, and I always feel like he's, he's, he's a lot like one of our friends um, who fights to the ability of his opponents. So whenever, he, <laughs> Ollie knows exactly what I'm talking about. W whenever he's fighting someone that doesn't really, doesn't really interest him, he doesn't feel threatened by them, Oftentimes he underperforms, and I think that has that has cost him in the in the past. And I think that putting him back in the middleweight division in the UFC against the likes of Adesanya and you know Marvin Vittori and uh, Kevin Holland, uh, there's some dynamite fights there for Gegard Mousasi. So that's that. The, you asked for two, I gave you three. Um, I can never make my mind up. Um, Joseph Corner, did anyone do enough to lure Khabib about a retirement? I, I would say that Michael Chandler looked incredible. I just don't think that Poirier's done enough to really prove that he's going to do anything different against Khabib by beating Connor. Whereas Michael Chandler's definitely a new, a new face and an exciting individual to drop into this division. And Charles Oliveira is the other one. We've got to, we've got to see what happens with him. But they're, they're, they're the two. We're not seeing Khabib otherwise. Courtney, shout out to Courtney, choke who. Um, uh, what's next for Calderwood and Pena? For Calderwood, as I, as I said, I, Chu Kagan is the one that makes sense to me. I mean, Lauren Murphy's on a win streak, so she doesn't really need to take that fight. Calvillo, I believe, is coming off a loss to Chu Kagan, so you know she might want to get a win in the column. But I would say that Calvillo or Chu Kagan rematches, if she can beat either of those, then that puts her in a strong position to argue for a title shot um, behind Jessica Andrade or maybe Lauren Murphy. But definitely at least one or two wins. And, and for Pena, similar situation. I mean, you know, she's she's picked up one one victory. I'd love to see her in there against Holly Holm, Raquel Pennington, um, Aspen Ladder would be a hell of a scrap. They, they're both, you know, feisty individuals come come to throw down. Um, so I think I think they ought, they make sense. Uh, but definitely, both ladies need more fights. Up the Dars. Where do I stand on the Hebus Rodriguez stoppage? Herb Dean leaving. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, it's 
we, you don't want to see those situations where, where a fighter looks like the fight's done and they're out and then the fight continues and they take a couple more shots. And there was an elbow, a clean elbow and a clean right hand, a power punch that she just didn't need to take in that fight. And it, and it was it would have been stopped with two or three more shots on the floor had the initiation to stop the fight, stop the fight, not been not been in there. I'm the stop the fight guy, aren't I? I can't believe it. The amount I love fighting. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, absolutely, it should have been stopped. You know, and, and I know there's the video circling from the the Cater Holloway fight as well with, with Dana. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, a, a fundamental change in the sport that we need. We need to, we need to address these things. We need to, we need people in there making clear, decisive, the fights over decisions. So there's no confusion because it swings both ways. You know, like, like you've got the the hesitation to stop the fight leading to that confusion where she took a bunch more punches that she didn't need to. Same thing with the the Ben Askren Robbie Lawler fight where there was a confusion and you can see Askren releases the guillotine as Herb's on his way in and then 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 you know Robbie Lawler's back in the game for a second. You, you just you just need those decisive actions, those moments where the referee decides the fight's over and they step in clean and they 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 get it themselves in between the competitors, and it goes the same for at the ends of rounds as well. Um, if, if the soon as the horn goes, it's the referee's job to be in in between those fighters. Like the horn is not the signal for the fighters; it's the signal for the referee. Um, so you know, it's just it's just indecisiveness at the top level always makes everybody else look bad. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it because I've dwelled on it far too far too long already. But you know my stance on it. Um, I love a good knockout as much as everybody, but I also want to make sure that these fighters fight as long as they can and as well as they can. Okay, right. It's time for, whew, there's the screen, the aftermath part of the show. So, hello everybody, and welcome to the aftermath part of the show. Right, I'm gonna jump, jump, gonna jump straight in. We're just gonna do main and co-main event. I wanna uh, point a couple of things out to you. So obviously the the co-main event was, was short and brutal and to the point and as i said earlier the game plan was quite simple quite straightforward but it was beautifully delivered beautifully delivered look at this immediately our hook is circling and, and, and he's moving in the direction that he's being forced by chandler i mean he's probably choosing to go in that direction to circle away from the right hand but at the same time you can see the intention of chandler is to is to he's cutting this door off here he's forcing hooker to move in that direction keep moving that way keep moving that way and I, and I spoke about it in the war room for McGregor Poirier, that choke point, which you will we'll see him using it in, in a moment. So as this progresses forward, you'll start to see Chandler. He starts to dig at the body a little bit. And and, and the reason he's doing this, he's, he's not, not really for any other purpose other than to keep Dan Hooker moving in this direction and also to keep him dropping his hands every time he steps in. Like, if you're Dan Hooker and you're facing Michael Chandler, you know full well that he's got a he's got a hell of a level change on him. And if he level changes, he's going to drive straight through you. One of the reasons I think Dan Hooker was skirting the fence is because he you know he's better at defending takedowns against the fence. So you know if you're going to shoot at me, at least shoot me into the fence where I can start defending quickly. I, I think a part of the the benefit in Michael Chandler being a strong wrestler is that he kept getting this reaction out of Dan Hooker as he was circling. As the punch was coming in, watch what Hooker's doing with his hands. So he's dipping, he's level changing, dip and then dip, like two dips there. So Hooker's not exactly sure what's going on. You can see him reach his lead hand out just to kind of create some space. And then as Chandler dips, the lead hand of Hooker comes down, like he hollows his body to try and take that punch. But look where that lead, lead hand is, lead arm. Like his head even comes forward as he's circling away. Like that could quite easily be just just a just a baiting tactic from uh, from uh, um, Chandler just to try and get Dan Hooker um, dropping his hands. It happens it happens again and again. Here we go. We're going to see it one more time as he pressures him forward. Here, watch where the hands are. Dips his level, lowers his level to throw the right hand, but then allows the right hand to bring his back leg forward, so he's in range for that left hook. But again, look where look where Hooker's hands are. He's in striking range. He's in striking range. He's forced back against the fence. He covers, but he expects a level change there. Look, you can see how Chandler dips his head and Hooker drops his level 
at the same time because he's expecting that level change underneath. He's expecting to try and act to have to defend a takedown here. And then Chandler dips again and you see Hooker, he level changes and he drops his backhand because this, this arm here is going underhook. That's his line of defense if Chandler is level changing. And you've got to bear in mind, Chandler's shooting into the fence. So all the drive coming in this direction is forcing Hooker back up against the fence. He needs this underhook ready to stop Chandler, like a forklift. Drive it under him and lift him back up so I'm not having to fight him off my legs. But the downside to that is it does leave you vulnerable. And as you can see here, as Chandler steps forward, he goes low, flicks that out. I mean, there's no intention of landing that. When someone's flicking a right hand out in this direction, there's no intention of landing it. You need to punch with that right hand. That is a is a bridge to the next punch. Watch how he throws it. Pulls his hand into his chest and extends it out, little finger first. But he's already doing it, traveling forward with his back leg. And then the big punch comes, pow. So it's a beautiful punch, beautiful knockout. And, and we see that thing with the choke point again, like he's forcing him into a choke point. Lovely work. And look where he falls against the against the fence. Like the choke point's here, like he's cut him off going in this direction. He's forced him to move in this direction. So Hooker's only option is to circle out. He's forced him into that position where he's, he's having to either make the decision to cover or to cover or to defend. And the two options were, well, I'm going to cover my body because that's where he keeps throwing and I'm going to drop my arms to underhook because I'm going to expect a level change following it. And then the left hook comes around the corner. It was a, it was a, a lovely game plan. Really efficiently delivered. You know, no, no, no fat on it. He just got straight into it. Forced him to circle into the direction that he wanted it. Set him up by continually level change and posturing the, the right hand to the body. And then as Hooker was extended, skirt along the fence, crack with the right with the with the left hook. Okay, main event. This was a weird start as well. I just want to leave this in just because it was a weird start. Okay, right. Fight's not started. Fight's not started. McGregor's already in the center. You can tell what his game plan is. He's on the monster energy drink sign before the fight's even started. And then her pushes him back a little bit. And he's not back in his corner. And he, he's, beck <laughs> he's beckoning Poirier on here. And then Connor sprints forward again. And Herb starts the fight right when he's on the center mark again. Very odd. Shouldn't have happened. But McGregor's pressuring. And he's in straight away. And he's backing Poirier up. And he, all of his weight's on his lead leg. Because what he's expecting to be able to do is to come over this jab in hand. He's expecting this pressure is going to force Poirier to fire this forward to try and keep some distance away as he's backing up. And then McGregor's going to loop this over his lead shoulder and crack him with that signature left hand. One of the several different ways that he can deliver this. He can drop back and crack him. He can slip and crack him or he can just loop straight over the top. But look how much weight is on McGregor's lead leg. Like he's just leaning so heavy. This is the old Julio Cesar Chavez technique. He's, he's already loaded his rear hand. Now, he's not going to throw it straight to the target because that's what Poirier is expecting. He's waiting for this hand to come out. Like, I mean, he's basically baiting Poirier with his own fist. Like, that's what he wants to do. He wants to come over the top of that look. But Poirier's done a good job of managing this range. Like, he gets out of the way of that left hand and he moves away. And then this one's even more important because now he counters him. And as I talked about in the war room, like most people, McGregor wants them circling along the fence in this direction. Poirier is being forceful in moving the, the in moving towards McGregor's left hand. And there's a benefit to this, which he, he reaps the rewards of in a moment. Stings a low kick, doesn't land too hard, bit toes on, on the calf. I don't think that was much of an impact. But then watch this. Watch how McGregor comes to counter over this lead, this jab of Poirier. And Poirier's out of the way of it. Look how that falls short. But the benefit here. And this was what was going on in the, the Nate Diaz fight as well. Because like I was explaining, Nate Diaz is like a like an inflatable punch bag. Like if you hit him at the top, he just drifts away and then he comes back. And because he was because McGregor was throwing towards that lead shoulder, he was basically doing this that Poirier is doing here. He was drifting away. He was riding that power into his lead shoulder and slapping him with the right hand. But Poirier is a bit more, a bit more successful with this in, in the way that he slips out of the way and then actually lands a nice, clean right hook on the ear of McGregor. 
So first of all, he's avoided two of McGregor's left hands and he's cuffed, cuffed him with a nice right hook. So Poirier's in a good state here. And he's backed McGregor up a little bit because McGregor's been tagged a couple of times, attacks the lead leg, and then he's going to level change in a moment, which is exactly what takes McGregor by surprise. And that was a beautiful takedown. So let me just examine this for a moment. So as he shoots in here, and it wasn't the best of shots, but the reason it worked is because he threw his left hand out in the process. Remember what I was saying about Michael Chandler flicking his arm out? Watch the way that this left, this, uh, left hand comes out. Back foot's off the floor. His intention was to close the distance. He's coming underneath McGregor's counter. He gets into that far side hip. So you can see he's got that hand right on his ass. Now McGregor's going to go into the takedown offense that we saw against Cowboy, where he just he gets he stiffs as a board and he rides the pressure as it's driven into him. I mean, he's basically planking takedown offense here. And as he does that, he's able to get his inside, he's able to get his uh his, his um left hand inside. But by this point, you can also see Poirier's managed to get a hand on the car, on the uh, the hamstring. And what's beautiful about this is he steers him like a like a, a big steering wheel on a bus. And as he's driving, he's keeping McGregor close with this hand, and he's going to pull this hand in. He's going to force McGregor to twist on the spot as he drives. Watch this: drive, 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 and then he twists. See how he pulls that in, steps his hips in and puts his foot on the outside. So there's no chance of McGregor recovering this left foot. There's no way he's going to be able to circle this out and plant it on the floor here before he's, before he's overextended and he's twisted. And then the drive down from that hand that was previously pulling McGregor in, he's now forcing McGregor down at the hip. Lovely takedown. And McGregor does a great job here, scrambles back to the fence. I mean, we're 30 seconds in, so much has happened already. Scrambles back to the fence, gets back up against the fence. You know, there's some striking in the clinch. And this was good work against the fence. Like McGregor's wrist control here is really nice. And the way he turns Poirier is beautiful as well here, which I'm going to start utilizing a little bit more because I, I, I didn't realize how effective it was until I saw McGregor use it so easily here. There's a, there's a certain benefit in grabbing in different ways to, you know, be able to use people's, you know, to use leverage against people. But look at, look at that control there, that wrist. Right, and that goes from an uncomfortable position. I'm just going to skip this back. This is a bit of a lesson: takedown defense, coming from someone that was never any good at defending takedowns. So take it with a pinch of salt. Look, look at the position of McGregor's hand there. Right now, that is that's 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 thumb down against the fence. That's an uncomfortable position to be in. What he wants to do is to use a C, the, the C of his index finger and thumb to control the wrist. That's what most people would do. You can extend that out. You've got a lot of control there. That reverse grip changes things entirely. And you can also see McGregor's got, oh, I can't do it there. McGregor's also got control here as well. So he's got reverse grip and a far side underhook. The reason, I mean, and I I'm, know I'm, I'm celebrating minutia here, but you know, I, hopefully this is why you tune into some of these breakdowns. Watch how he's controlling this wrist here. And he also lands a cracking knee in this process as well, which gets a reaction from the fans. And watch that part of Poirier's body. See the impact of that knee coming through his rib cage. You know that's a good shot. You know he felt that. Okay. So watch this control that McGregor's got. Watch how he circles this hand up. He's got that underhook still. You can still see those fingers on that on that uh, that far side. He's going to lift Poirier up because he's got an arm all the way across his body. See, Poirier's got a grip there, but McGregor's controlling that wrist all the way through. He never lets go of it. Never lets go of it. He's got that far side underhook, which means that Poirier can't put any pressure onto that, onto that leg. So he breaks the grip. Watch how he circles this short knee. But now the wrist is it. Now the wrist is turned in this direction. So by McGregor forcing this wrist around and turning the corner on Poirier, he's actually forcing an Americana position onto the shoulder. He's actually hyperextending it in the opposite way. Now this, Poirier could fight against that all day, but this is a very debilitating position that McGregor's using really well against him. Watch this. Grabs the wrist, turns it, and drives it to the fence. And Poirier knows it's a weakness because he swims back inside, look. Swims in straight away. Like he knows that's a weakness and McGregor does a great job of utilizing that bit of leverage. And then he's into shoulder strikes. Definitely an improvement for McGregor in the, uh, in, in the clinch striking range. Okay, 
So minute left. Now McGregor starts to find his way back into this first round. And I, I think he starts to do quite well. But but he's still leaning, leaning heavy on this lead leg and looking for a counter shot. I mean, he tags Poirier a couple of times, but what I like about this is that Poirier is not adamant on getting him back every time he lands. But watch this low kick, and it's it's kind of awkward because it's on the camera angle change. I will try and get a different camera angle for you. But McGregor steps in heavy with a jab. All of his weight's on his lead leg because he's going to pitch that left over the top. Look at that. He takes that full onto that calf right across the leg. I mean, that. You can even see the shadow, the indentation where the calf's landing on the leg. I think that was one of the most damaging techniques that Poirier landed because it immediately got a, a reaction out of McGregor who then twists awkward on that lead leg. Watch this. Watch how he gets slightly overextended. I'm just slow-mo it. He slightly overextends and Poirier cuffs him. But that's an uncomfortable twist on that leg. He's already a vulnerability there, but all of his weight still on that lead leg takes another kick. Poirier's hanging back. Let's him work a little bit. Chops him one more time. I mean, it's it's just it's good work from Poirier. He's not getting drawn in. McGregor even checks that one. This is what I was talking about earlier. Like he turns his leg into it, but that's still a full power kick on that calf. That's still going to do a lot of damage to that nerve, even with a check. You, he would need to bring the point of his knee further around in order to do any kind of any kind of damage back to Poirier and maybe discourage him. Um, very effective first uh, first uh, round for for Poirier who basically just let McGregor work a lot of the time. So watch the opening of the second round. Again, McGregor's right out in the center of the octagon. He's putting all of his weight on his lead leg again. Bang, that hurt him. And then Poirier just then coasts a bit and lets him work again. Like he's backed up against the fence. He knows the left hand's coming. He knows he can take shots on and around his guard and it's not going to bother him too much and he can keep investing in that low kick and it's eventually going to take the sting out of all of those punches anyway. He's just biding his time. He's not biting back at anything. He's playing this very calm and very sensible. And then there's a kick here, which is coming in a second. It, it, this is the one where you really see McGregor's leg twist uncomfortably. And Poirier recognizes it because he takes the center off him almost straight away. Watch this. Bang. And then that weird twist from McGregor there not only, not only shows that, that Poirier's kick landed cleanly, but it also gives Poirier the opportunity to cut right round and take the center again. And that's when you know you've got a veteran fighter. They know when to take a bite out of their opponent. And they also know when to back them into a corner and finish them off. Watch this. Slow-mo. McGregor heavy on the lead leg. Bang. Big chop. And then the leg got an awkward twist. And immediately Poirier's like, oh, I saw that. I saw that. Now, McGregor is now doing things that are uncharacteristic. This is what we saw against Nate Diaz when he starts to, to level change and to get his head out of the way. And he fires back. But Poirier is out of the way. He's not bothered about those shots. This is when Poirier is in the flow. This is when he starts squaring his shoulders up and you're only punching his chin into his shoulders. You're not going to knock him out at this stage because he's he's in his flow. I mean, this looks like the end of the, 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 uh, the, the, the Pettis fight to me. And that was absolute gold dust. Because the variety of his shots are all targeted at McGregor's head. But he recognizes that level change. Headshot, headshot. Look, it's like heat-seeking missiles. Like he he alters the level of that punch because he sees McGregor's go, going straight down to it. Bam, cracks him on the forehead and just drops him against the fence. Watch it from the other angle. You'll see what I mean. It's it, it's a Watch how he, he adjusts the punch. You can see as, as he's moving along. Misses a few, but when he's in this rhythm, like he just flows from one leg to the next. Look at that little adjustment. Bang. I mean, that is the best punch he's thrown in his career. And you can see it jar into McGregor's neck here as well. That's the shot wave going straight through his, through his forehead. Bang. Damn. Beautiful. Great finish by Poirier. And a great performance. And not the last we'll see of McGregor, absolutely. You know, he's a fantastic competitor. I, I, I think... I think what what we've seen is two guys two guys deliver performances in in the lightweight division that are going to get Khabib's interest, but maybe not enough that's going to get him out of retirement. I mean, that was the big question going into two fifty seven was what's going to get Khabib back out of retirement because we still don't really know what's happening with the belt. Like we don't know the next time it's going to be contested or who's going to get it around their waist next. Uh, we don't know whether Khabib's going to come back and defend it against one of these guys that's still kind of up in the air. 
Like, and that almost feels like the UFC is not stripping him just yet because they want him to come back. Michael Chandler looked excellent. I think he needs another win or two before he's going get, to get interest out of Khabib. I think if he beats Charles Oliveira, that's like beating two individuals at once. But I think Poirier's got work to do before he gets a rematch with Khabib. It'd be much easier for him to fight somebody else for a vacant title, of which he's probably deserving immediately. Um, yeah. How long's that been? Nearly an hour. I can talk constantly, can't I? I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope it's made some sense. Uh, send us over your questions next time and uh, I'll be doing these for, for every post-fight from, from now on. And, uh, I'll, well, I guess I can retire my Fight Island sunglasses now, can't I? Catch you all next time.